Welcome to the Courtside Podcast, Courtsiders. Uh, sorry for the delay in between the last podcast, but I'm sure the conversation you're about to listen to will uh, will make up for that. Today's guest is a sports psychologist of high renown who talks very passionately about enabling and equipping young players to know themselves better and therefore how that translates into them knowing how they play their game through their own personality better. This is a great uh, conversation with someone who's going to help us as parents understand more of the world and the and the emotional pressures of what it is like to play a sport that you are passionate about. My guest today is Julie Blackwood. My name is Andy Burns and this is the Courtside Podcast. So Julie, welcome to uh, Courtside. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we're here to kind of explore or start with Courtside, the whole conversation is around sports psychology because it's a, it's an area that gets often uh, talked about, but as parents we might not know a whole great deal about it. Um, but just before we dive into can you give us a, a background of your journey in sport and in tennis in particular? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um journey in, in tennis started probably age five, same way as many people going down the, the local club yeah. um, on Saturday morning coaching. Um, my parents got me a, a racket with multicolored strings. I think that's why <laughs> I, I liked tennis at the beginning. Um, and then, yeah, sort of went on from there. Age eight, I could beat my brother and his friends who were two years older at the time. So I found that quite fun. That, that was, felt good. Yeah, that felt good. So, so kind of carried on playing and then People were, oh, you might might be all right. This and um, yeah, to sort of an individual lesson, and um, then played my first tournament at age nine. Started playing for the county, so North of Scotland County yeah. is my my county. Uh, from um, under tens, really, and then all the way through. And those are some of my sort of best memories in tennis, yeah. I suppose. All the the county competitions, uh, and I now still captain and play for North of Scotland ladies Fantastic. so that was uh, I suppose a bit of the the journey in tennis um I suppose also I studied at Loughborough University so part of the decision to go and study hmm. there was very much the tennis program that I could continue playing and competing um on the teams there how, how was that because a lot of parents we chat to is kind of looking at the collegiate type system we think of the states but obviously it exists here in the UK how did you find that as a student athlete? Yeah, absolutely. So I didn't hugely consider the American collegiate route. I think um, maybe, yeah, quite quite like being at home or, or like not hugely far away. And also I think I was a very good student uh, mm-hmm. as well, sort of like straight one, straight A's type thing. So the university bit for me was, uh, you know, or the education bit for me was always the primary component yeah. and the sport secondary whereas and, and in the states that that is the case for some or they they managed to balance it um but certainly yeah, it was to go to an institution that was sort of renowned for for what it yeah. did and then um yeah to, to play tennis and, and compete as a bonus there but i thought just last but there was a phenomenal amount of sport that went on so um i played tennis like growing up i also played played table tennis but coming to university um, dabbled with volleyball a bit because mm-hmm. obviously having hand-eye coordination yep. I'm a lefty as well so that that worked out quite well um, and then also got involved with Lusbury has a huge hall sport culture so we played I, I was a sports secretary for my hall of residence we played over the course of the academic year 27 different sports <laughs> against the other 15 <laughs> halls of residence which is unbelievable when you think about it because as, as a sports secretary it was essentially like a part-time job yeah. like 10 to 12 hours per week probably organizing all these fixtures um going to them playing them all sorts of different sports so i kind of loved that and that was a lot different to my experiences it was, wasn't a huge amount of sport going on like at this the school and things that was always very much kind of outside of school but um yeah i played a lot of my yeah. tennis so we just heard uh recently or i just kind of noticed on twitter sphere uh, an interview with roger federer kind of really encouraging parents to encourage their kids not to early specialization too much mm. so would would you say that kind of the breadth of sport that you engage with helped you in the in your tennis yeah I think so I mean yeah I did so as I say sort of picked up the table tennis because again hand-eye coordination yep. actually probably did better at that for a while but I think 
Um, I didn't like the idea of um, playing a lot of sort of dingy halls and doing training camps on weekends. I'd much rather be kind of outside. And I think, yeah, definitely engaging in different sports is something that's hugely helpful just just in terms of developing skills, yep. not um, not just for, for your sport, but also understanding your sport better because you know what the differences are mm. in other sports as well. We often talk a little bit um uh, do some optimal competition parenting workshops for for the lta and we often talk about actually how weird would it be um to tell a group of 10 year old boys that oh by the way the referee's not turning up for the football yeah. match today you've got to referee your own game go <laughs> but but yeah we do that in tennis all the time so i think yep. for understanding some of the differences between the sports um that is is relevant as well and I just, for, for me, I, I've kind of noticed that a little step change in our son at the moment. He plays a fair bit of football now with his school, but he still says tennis is his sport. But actually, when you weigh up how many hours of football or tennis, they're quite comparative. And yet he seems now to have stepped up and loved his tennis more. Now he plays football more. It's as if he's not getting bored with just one thing in his life all the time. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's quite valuable as well to have those kind of multiple <coughs> identities. And again, not yeah. hang your, your hat on one thing. I was at a peer supervision that we have with a, a group of chartered sites last week, and um, someone was talking about a CPD that they'd gone on, and the, the guy was talking about dual careers and encouraging everybody be a chair because a chair um, yeah. has four legs, and when it's on the ground, it, it's stable because they're developing those kind of yeah. multiple identities, education, um, and different sports. Um, whereas obviously if the chair is only on one leg, then um, yeah, that more more unstable position to be so, in. So what drew you into kind of sports psychology, into that into that world? What, was it kind of a, an, an interest or? Yeah, I mean, going to university, so my undergraduate degree was actually geography and sports science, and it was a very strange combination, but... Um, <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> two totally separate subjects, <laughs> joint honours. Um, but I didn't really understand the job prospects from sports science, so I didn't want to do that as a degree as a whole. Everywhere else I applied actually for purely yeah. geography. That was the subject that I kind of connected with most at school. didn't study PE at school, it was biology, so some link there. Um, and at university I had no idea I was interested in psychology. I didn't yeah. pick the module in first year because I had that joint honours, I had some, some choices. Um, I picked it up in, in second year module with Sophia Jowett. She does a lot of research in the coach-athlete mm -hmm. relationship. So it was um, psychological factors in competitive sport. Really engaged with that one. And then we had uh, another professor, uh, David Fletcher, in my, my third year of my undergrad. And it was psychology of sporting excellence. Yeah. So we just spend uh, classes trying to break down different constructs of confidence anxiety and how all these different things were experienced so I, I thought that that was so fascinating and and when I was studying it and playing on the the teams at the university I was sort of using myself as a guinea pig and starting to go that would have been so helpful to yep. know and and start to understand some of those things when I was playing and maybe I would have been able to see some situations that I was in quite differently as a result of that so yeah off the back of um, my undergraduate then decided that I wanted to become a, a sports psychologist mm. at, at that stage and because I'd studied sports science first um, I needed to convert to psychology first and that was the the route to becoming chartered as a, a sport yeah. and exercise psychologist so you're at Glasgow master's in pure psychology and um, back to Loughborough master's in sport and exercise psychology uh, to, to kind of yeah. specialize um and then, yeah, from there you do like a chartership qualification, which is essentially um, like, like a trainee in, in many other domains, trainee lawyer or junior doctor type thing you're practicing, but there is a whole portfolio of evidence you have to submit, case studies, reflections, yeah. and so forth. So, yeah, I guess that's how I got drawn into it. It wasn't planned. Yeah. Um, and then from there, tennis, because I'd been in the sport and around the sport, I was coaching at this stage as well it kind of seemed like a really logical place to start that's great so i've got kind of uh, a growing up narrative of uh, those uh, of kind of psychologists for people who mentally weren't strong enough so how, how how much is it of sport do they need sports psychologists because they literally are not strong enough to engage with the game uh, compared to sports psychology giving players the ability to understand themselves better in the game I think that's quite a, a traditional conception yeah. of psychology. Um, 
not just sports psychology actually mm-hmm. just psychology as a whole that it, it's, it's a problem thing go good somebody in uh, a fixer um i have a coach that i work quite closely with who um often refers to people see psychology as like a physio to kind of fix something yep. rather than seeing it as a sort of strength and conditioning coach as it were um and and kind of this idea and and actually in the states they quite often will call them mental conditioning coaches which is kind of on that par with with um physical conditioning if you like um i I think we're definitely moving away from that i think sometimes the the media and elite athletes using sports sites uh does, does wonders there but um yeah i think a lot of it is just people trying to understand themselves better um that's certainly what i'm always trying to do understand thoughts feelings behaviors um yeah what's underlying that and how someone can kind of maximize and yeah. get the best out of themselves um so so yeah supporting people in order to, to do so that you, you put a premium on kind of players knowing themselves better and therefore if you know yourself better that helps your performance is that what you kind of look at i think it would be be the fir- first stage to, to enhancing yeah. the performance because for me um, well, firstly, understanding the demands of the game, and like yeah. I talked about, so it's quite a unique sport. Um, you know, you don't get very much performance feedback from from the sport. Um, in terms of, uh, you do at the very highest level, you see the stats yeah. fr- from the matches, but it's quite hard to see progress. Have I done better in that match mm. from from uh, three weeks ago's competition? Um, so, so some of those measurables, um, I think we kind of struggle with, and that can then make it quite socially comparative. We work against the tide with some of the sort of rating systems and things that we have that maybe promote mm-hmm. more kind of fixed beliefs about ability. Yep. Um, in in my own eyes, um, so yeah, if you, you kind of understand the, the demands and things that you're what what tennis is asking of you, you mentally, but also how you typically respond to different situations, so. Things like, um, you know, what are my tendencies under pressure? What yeah. makes me tick? What presses my buttons? Yeah. Um, then I think oh, only then can you start to, if you have that awareness, actually, okay, well, stress levels rising here, um, to then be able to put in place strategies yeah. to to help you uh, in those times, yeah. uh, and also where that's coming from, and start start to unpick that. So that awareness bit, I think, is a, a kind of key step on the the journey. Yeah, I, f- I find that interesting because at the club where we're at. Uh, the club have started to offer a couple of sessions for each of the players, so I just caught up in that with a sports psychologist. Um, I don't know whether you use this this piece of kit. It seemed quite uh, cool, really. They, they put some sensors on Elijah's fingers, and when he was calm, the car on the TV screen went forward. The minute his anxiety level went up, <clears throat> the car would stop. Uh, and so he liked it because it's an interactive game. He had to try and get this Formula One car around a track, so he was engaged. Uh, and the sports psychologist started throwing in some thoughts into his mind, and then it was fascinating when you saw the car suddenly break. You're like, why did why did you get anxious about that? And what for us particularly with the podcast on courtside, what was interesting was in a non tennis environment, no racket in hand, no pressure at all. It's just a silly little game. He he's Elijah got the car going around the track well, <clears throat> and the guy went, and now your dad's watching, and the car just went. Aah! And he, and he, his instant response was he spun around to me, sorry, Dad, you don't really make me nervous. I'm like, I obviously do. There's something about uh, my presence, and then if we take this straight back to a tennis context, being courtside that makes you anxious, even though I don't believe I'm projecting anything. I obviously am. Even though I'm not banging on the side or demanding certain things from... There's something about our dynamic which co- which adds pressure instead of me being around as being a releaser of pressure. And so as dad, A, I felt incredibly guilty. Uh, he now feels guilty because, anyhow, but it's a fabulous triangle you get into, circle you get into all that. But it's a real fascinating dynamic about knowing how you'd respond under pressure. Yeah, so there's quite a lot of the, the sort of biofeedback tools yeah. that have got heart math and, and so forth. Um, and, and they are really interesting and a great kind of visual way to actually see yeah. how you're responding to different things. I mean, in, in that instance, I think <laughs> it's just... Uh, kind of a uh, uh, way of explaining it, uh, almost your opinion mat- matters yeah. to him I think yeah. um, you know and that that can be what what's mm. going on there is actually yes yeah, this is this is therefore more more important to me yeah. type thing um, so yeah it's quite interesting to to see that and, and like you say whether that's 
um, in, intentional or not and, and how that's perceived yeah. or, or whether he would kind of know that that's the case or his body is responding in mm. that way so but yeah they can be really in- interesting tools to to use yeah so the the last la- last tournament we were at um we we arrived and it was one of the first ones uh <clears throat> of a previous podcast and we kind of arrived because it was a long drive so we're all going out anyhow it's one of those days where if he says no we're going to be sat in a cafe for six hours because we couldn't scoop back home uh and we said do you want us to watch you or is that add pressure we went, just have a coffee and you're like oh flipping heck <laughs> so the coffee bill goes huge because you got nothing else to do for the rest of the day uh and he and he came back and he'd done well <clears throat> and so he said the next game you can watch now i'm all right and so for the next and then he won the tournament that's by the by it was the fact that uh he needed to give us permission to watch instead of just as assuming that well, we've driven you there and that's that's an interesting transition point for us as as parents yeah. watching him play yeah or not it's quite interesting because i kind of remember having some of those I, th- I think a lot of kids do as yeah. to um whether their parents watched or not um mine so it was uh, i think my dad's probably watched me play tennis about three times in his entire <laughs> life he'd much rather read the paper or uh, yeah just um yeah just not we've actually got him quite a lot into sport we watch a yeah. lot more tennis on the tv now so he's into it now so maybe that would be a different different story but um, it was always kind of my mum that, that drove me around and, and came to, to tournaments and things. And yeah, there definitely were, were some stages where I'd kind of do that, you know, that signalling yep. of go away. Um, and I think part of that, or, or at different times, wanted to, to watch as well as kind of like my, my lucky charm if it went well yeah, last yeah. time. Um, I think a lot of that was as I got older, kind of that awareness of the the sort of finance and things that was going into yeah. my tennis. And yeah. so then potentially me feeling like there was an expectation to do better or be better than I had yeah. been in the previous match, which kind of looking back on it now, okay, how logical is that? And also how tangible is yeah. that to see that, that improvement? Because like we've just said, it's quite often difficult to to measure and, yeah. and you can see it some of the time or, or they might have seen it uh, not having seen me play in a while but I was certainly more conscious of that I think as I, yeah. as I got older so yeah really interesting uh, and, and good conversations to have yeah, with definitely. kids as well as to what they, they want from you or if they do want you to watch yeah. still what <clears throat> they want because as well I remember times where you know my my mum might have left the, the court side I mean she kind of did own kind of bits of emails or read books you know she was kind of there but maybe chatting with nattering with other parents and things like that but times where she would kind of leave and I'd be like oh my goodness I think she must think that I'm playing really badly (laughs) and then she she'd have just gone to the toilet or gone to get a coffee and and again I was reading far too much into that um so again it's quite interesting or just setting those expectations of oh I might disappear off for a little while or I might have to take a call or or those sorts of things because um it's really interesting how you can interpret those on court uh, as well and it's all then that's partly about where you position yourself on the court anyhow because sometimes we've got ourselves sat and then we've got locked in with other parents and our presence isn't being helpful you're like I literally now can't leave. So we've had to kind of almost scan the land of that's a good place to stand. And as you say, almost fabricate, well, I might need to take an email in a minute. So if he ever sees me disappear, oh, it's, it's probably the email thing. And I'm like, but <clears throat> we had a, we had another moment uh, last week, was it the week before, whenever it was, time just is in a muddle, um, where halfway through the game, he was emotionally losing it and literally was emotionally losing because we were watching and we it's almost as if we were sat there was giving legitimizing him to have a strop because uh, he kept looking at us and having a good rant uh, and my wife just said we just need to leave and you kind of thought that if we leave he might well he's going to lose the match anyhow so we we walked off <clears throat> and it was he was something like two eight down in a is it super tiebreak king's tiebreak whatever it was so match tiebreak, he matched yeah. that, and so it's up to ten and we walked off and he got into an internal grump of right well if they're not going to help me I'll do it myself and then he went and won it <laughs> and so we had this odd conversation in the car of thanks a lot for leaving me my moment of need I'm like <laughs> but did you win the match because we left and sometimes <clears throat> our presence around the court almost seems to give him permission to get grumpy whereas if I'm not around the court well it's I'm on my own I've got to work this out 
and sometimes he does then work it out yeah so it's it's fascinating yeah. dynamic yeah and just that age of kind of that growing independence yeah, anyway yeah, yeah. Uh, as well and, and wanting to to do things by myself rather than i don't need you around <laughs> as, as you go grow older so, so how does your work well, how does your work outwork when you're engaging with 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 players or with parents or with coaches how, how does that actually work in a day-to-day basis yeah so so can be hugely different yeah. day-to-day um depending if you're working in private practice with an individual um whether you're working at team level um or, or whether you're working kind of within a system so um some of my works with the the british uh, university student team um or british student team however you like to call it um and so that would be very much working at, at team level um don't work kind of hugely on a an individual basis just kind of as and, and when and if there are things that they want input on but a lot of that w- would be so they're the the best university players so so you mentioned the two kind of mm. systems um both both here the the performance university setups here and um in the state so as long as they're they're british um citizen uh, yeah. they can play for the british university team whether they're studying here or, or at us college or, or anywhere else for that matter it just tends that those are the the main two um so the team kind of brings together players from these different institutions and puts them together with essentially like national coaches there's, there's two uh, coach or one coach one team manager and uh, especially so that they play world university games which is huge event it's yeah. the second biggest multi-sport event behind the olympics and paralympics wow. um but they also play world uh, team champs type event uh in in december in in france and when we're going away to those sorts of things uh the the coaches can sit on court with the players a bit like davis cup they yeah. sit on the the entire time so it's really important and my my role then becomes around facilitating the relationships between the players coming from these different institutions and the the coaches that they're on court with so that they can kind of understand i sort of feed back in some some notes from conversations with the players on you know how they want to be supported um what you know what they've liked from from coaches in the past what they want you to hold them mm-hmm. accountable for and so forth and so it just kind of accelerates that process and after day one the coach will come back and be like oh yeah da, 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 oh I need to revisit on on that and, and so that can be quite an interesting process and an, another team process we have around that is just understanding the the culture we often talk about event to event um it's quite a transitional squad because obviously people aren't at, at university forever um and so just having some expectations of what you're coming into and how we operate as a team we have some principles around um, you know, it's not what happens, but how you respond and, and also things like, um, if in doubt, be aggressive because we know that international matches aren't won by kind of yeah. holding back. And you might have some reasons that you, you know um, why you would play more conservative on, on a certain point, but, um, you know, the team backs you to go for it yeah. um, and kind of having that permission to do yeah. so. so. So there's some principles and stuff around that that I think, again, compared to, um, you know, like a, an international competition where you would spend maybe a week training with those same players we maybe have a couple of days and then you're straight into it so just to accelerate some of those processes that might be my role around more more of a team uh, again a system work a lot with uh, not only with athletes but with coaches um, and, and other support staff so um, you know if we have some some core behaviors and things that we, we hang our hats on then actually how do we go about as coaches as parents etc developing resilience or um independence in the 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 players what what is it that we would have to do with our coaching or or how could we support them to develop that as a parent Mm -hmm. so those are really interesting conversations and i think um there's quite a lot of kind of collaborative learning that that goes on around those those things um if it's kind of on that that individual basis then it's very much just trying to understand um the, the, the players backgrounds their sort of experiences inside of the sport outside of the sport their personality how that links in and interplays uh when they're they're on court um and then trying to kind of formulate from there what we think is kind of going on for them yeah really trying to to kind of get everyone to to support 
that I think quite often you can work maybe just in isolation with an athlete but so much more beneficial if everyone's in the loop and on the same page so if I'm working with um in that more sort of developmental age group quite often we'll have a have a session one-to-one but also for the last like 10 minutes um we'll kind of agree what what we're happy to kind of discuss or the, the players happy to discuss with um parents or, or, or coaches that sort of thing and then they'll kind of come in for that last 10 yeah. minutes and go right well these are the things and also it's quite a good check-in for me because I understand what they've yeah. picked up and what they're taking from it um or what they're interpreting yeah exactly so I think that's quite <clears throat> quite a good way of getting everybody on the, the same page but also they have some accountability yeah. or the, the parent or, or whoever can remind them of of certain things So do you, do you think there is a role for us as parents within that? And there's that ability to kind of affirm the learning a yeah. little bit more, which I think is some one of the key roles that we have as parents going, did you hear what was said there? That was affirming. And they're pleased with you on this. Oh, I didn't pick that up. And so there's constant yeah. little nudges of encouragement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is there, is there any, do you notice any kind of within the psychology world for, for players when it stops being just play and while wow, this is getting serious are there any kind of emotional changes in how maybe a young athlete sees themselves and their sport compared to maybe when they did when they were younger and this is just just was fun if you get the kind of analogy there to that they now have to click or something has to change within them yeah, they, they they can be definitely. Um, I think you know there's all sorts of different brain changes and things yeah. that that go on as they they go through. Um, I think for for me it's quite interesting. You maybe see that some that come through the system and are successful quite early on, versus maybe some mm-hmm. that are those kind yeah. of longer burners, if you like. Um, and so quite often there, and and that that might be related to them seeing it more seriously, yeah. is that they're actually doing better in inverted commas maybe in terms of results is, is what I'm uh, saying there so so uh, we talked a little bit around that that kind of lack of performance feedback in tennis but a lot of tennis is quite um sort of e- ego involving and mm-hmm. what I mean by that is it's just kind of the nature of tournaments all the results being publicly posted you having some sort of number next to your name that's an indication of y- your ability level um supposedly or, or, yeah, or linked yeah. to that um and, and so quite a lot of these things can really get players thinking in, in ways that are kind of all about kind of winning and outperforming others and gaining a sense of achievement from yeah. that um, rather than gaining a, a sense of achievement from kind of personal mastery of, of yeah. their skills. Um, so sometimes you can see that well, when they're coming through some of those stages. And I think that's such an important one. And, and again, going back to, I mentioned earlier, the, the kind of optimal competition mm-hmm. parenting workshops that um, I tutor on. And that's really one of the key messages. And it's come out of, of research at, at Loughborough University with Sam Thrower and, and Chris Harwood yeah. um, supervising that as a as a project and Sam's PhD was basically hanging around tennis balconies talking to parents that was <laughs> uh, he'll, he'll laugh world. if he listens to this it was much more <laughs> than that but but a lot of time spent so just trying to understand some of the yeah. the stresses and, and different things that were going on and I think that's one thing that that parents kind of take away yeah. from the workshop is like okay well yeah the they they are really driven by by winning and of course they're going to be they're they're competitive right yep. everyone wants to to win but i think where where it's damaging is where they don't have that high kind of task orientation at the same time because mm-hmm. um you know if they go through a bad spell of form or if they go up an age group or that you know they're out with injury for a little while and coming back into it things like that then can be quite demotivating rather yep. than actually it's about me and my personal improvement yep um and I, yeah there's a huge sort of extension of that into to competition um and i think sometimes when we get serious we see competition as like more of a a test and a kind of yeah about about the winning rather than actually it's all development opportunities yep. and you know what what is the training for if it's not for that but development i think sometimes unfortunately we've gone quite far away from that um what that's to do with you you can kind of hypothesize a little bit or I think a lot of people used to learn the game by playing the game and now there's quite a lot of coaching so I think a lot of kids kind of think oh I'm 
being coached um, and, and therefore when I step onto the competition or, or the match court, I should know exactly what to do yeah, yeah. and just kind of expecting that. Whereas actually, yeah, sometimes then if they can't figure things out or if they don't have kind of specific goals to work on, they might end up going back to that default mode, if you like, and actually doing the same things that they, they used yeah. to rather than going after their game act actively and trying yeah. to develop it through the match. I think we, we maybe see a lot of kids hitting the, the default button. In, um, so, and so, what, so what can we do as parents in that context? So I guess the, the past however many podcasts we've done, you know, for every single conversation has had some little overlap with process. And so if we, if we all are now card-carrying believers of process, we still have at some point an 11, a 12 or a 13-year-old going, but I haven't won a plastic tennis trophy and, and my some of those winning trophies are spectacular to, to see sometimes, but I haven't had one of those for a year. Yeah. And there's only, <clears throat> it feels sometimes, that there's all, only so much I can continue to affirm of, but your serve's got stronger, mate. You're more brave at the and, and But there's sometimes in their head that click of, but I haven't got one of those medals in a while and she keeps getting them. And whilst I might be a card-carrying believer in process, there are some times when taking home not the greatest plastic trophy in the world means a huge amount. And so how do we manage that tension? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that does come back to some of the, the things that I mentioned around that, yeah. that kind of keeping that, that task orientation high because, um, yeah, it's also what they define as success. And yeah. I suppose as a parent, you have quite a big role in kind of shaping yep. their interpretations of that um and, and yes you're right in both we yeah, and in society the, the kind of success and, and winning equation is quite interesting um certainly I think me as a junior I think I thought success was winning and mm. probably that rather than <clears throat> I probably have much broader conception of what it is now um so yeah absolutely i would expect that it, it does matter i think um as a parent you can certainly reinforce um you know that they, they are trying to do everything in terms of learning and, and actually having those conversations that help the mm. place to ref or the child to reflect on what it ha what's gone on so that they can kind of understand it and and learn from it and I think I think also as well as helping keep perspective that's much easier if you're getting exposure to lots of different competitive experiences okay. so it's quite easy I suppose if you're going around the same sorts of circuits and playing the same sorts of players which I did a lot when because <laughs> in Scotland and and um in, you know in girls there was a lot yeah. less uh players than than on the boys side of things so we ended up playing each other an awful lot yeah. which which then does become quite an ego-protective thing of, oh, I haven't lost to them before, I don't want to lose. And, yeah. and maybe, again, like I just mentioned, me not going after my game and, and playing maybe more safe or conservative mm -hmm. variety of tennis. Um, so I think if, you know, whether it's you're playing like older players, even if it's, um, yeah, a young player playing like a club, a club member who's 40-odd and just loves it, yeah. Um, or kind of going to different, it doesn't necessarily have to be different countries, but sort of just having a real range of competitive experiences. Because I think if you have that and you play lots of different, you kind of realize that it, mm. that it is about getting all those different opportunities rather than playing the, the same people again. There is value in that as well, actually. And I think, um, you know, a lot of other countries have a lot healthier like nationals and things mm. like that. I think a lot of our top juniors don't play for it for, and for whatever reason and um the, the importance maybe that's, that's yeah. placed on that so there is definitely that value to, to coming back and having some of the the pressures associated with maybe being um a higher seed in a tournament and playing against people that, that yeah. you know but also yeah going out there and playing against different opposition i think helps keep that perspective even if it's not winning trophies you you're kind of understanding that you are all you're never going to be the biggest fish nope. there's always going to be another kind of step up and step up um but, but as well uh, other things in the environment things like uh, uh, academies and so forth where um efforts rewarded I, I love that because i think there's so many um places i, I do sort of some tutoring or presenting on some of the the coaching qualifications and 
Um, part of it's about kind of value-driven behavior and sort of them considering who they are as people and how they want to run their yep. um, their setups. And one of the things around that, I always see so many posts about X, Y, or Z winning yep. X, Y, or Z grades. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't, don't get me wrong. And we should celebrate that success. But what I don't see is the same level of celebration of the effort and hard work and grind you do see it from some places and um, yeah. it's not a- across the board but and, and i understand that sometimes it's trying to attract people into mm. the the setup we've got these players and they're doing well yep. so we must be doing something right yep. um but i think i think that's something as um as a sport that we could be doing more of is recognizing those successes so i i, I don't know in school we have things like merit badges don't we for yep for different things but just that idea if you had like a player of the month or it could even be weak or so forth that that's almost and that's your process yeah. plastic trophy and I think yeah. if we get to a place where that means almost almost as much as, as what the kind of winning the tournament means and that's a really healthy place because they're then judging themselves yeah. and their um their level and their ability based on some of those more kind of controllable mm. forms of, of mastery yeah. and, and things whereas obviously competition we know there's a lot of uncontrollables and, and the margins are so small yeah. as well and I think that's another demand especially of, when you're calling your own lines as well yeah. the margins get even smaller yeah and-, um, and, and so obviously you know we all know that you can win more points in a tennis match and, and lose yeah. um, you can be I think this is one that kids find it really hard to get themselves around I actually had this at um county week in the summer um so I'll use that as my example we we were set in five four serving and 40 30 and sudden death juice so we actually had two match points at that stage uh lost both those points we were one point away from the match for two points yeah. lost both those points we're now five all in second set eight points away from winning the match lost that set we were a match tiebreak yeah. in the third but had we been a third set we'd have we've been 24 points away but but almost being reset to 10 so that's so interesting i think that for young kids to get their head around that the goalposts are moving yes <laughs> you know in in football i think you can get away with kind of um if you're two nil in the lead maybe parking the bus i think is mm-hmm. a strategy yeah. i'm not a football expert but but playing more defensively you know taking defenders back and so forth sometimes you get away with that in tennis yep. but uh, a lot of the time you don't or if the opposition yep. is, is good enough you don't so yeah getting their heads around that that there's kind of no time limit and it mm. could go on And but also that that's not a, a them problem I get a lot of kind of oh yeah I can't close out match at the moment da, da, da. And, and yes there, there are things around that um, potentially strategies and, and rumination things that you might talk about but, but equally I think understanding that that's a tennis problem not a me problem so um yeah maybe as another example uh, if if you watch a a bit of tennis I think it's so helpful because it was I watched a lot of French Open last year no sorry 2017 French Open I think you'll have to check all this but (laughs) get my years right but Halep in the the semi was a set and five one down against Vitalina yeah came back and won the match sort of kind of dugging went you know quite quite quiet and just worked away um won that match and then um as people maybe more know it was a set and three love up in the final yep. um against Ostapenko and lost and so I think just to see <laughs> best player in the world yep. and at that level that you can go from one day and then a couple of days later uh, almost the, the reverse I think that's so important to to kind of be able exactly. to understand and get your head around um, so yeah, there's some things around that. I've kind of gone off on a tangent. I no, think. no, it's, <laughs> the, bit, <clears throat> the bit that was getting uh, kept on re- reflecting on me is kind of the praising of the intent. So some of the things. So I, I'm learning bits about my parenting through watching how the coaches are coaching. Uh, and so one of the things that I've often noticed is, uh, particularly Jordan, one of the largest coaches, he always has the phrase. It's it's French. He's got this kind of line. He goes, "I like the look of that." I like so even if the ball went out. He's praising that was the right shot. We're just gonna we're gonna help you master your top spin. So next time the ball will dip and it won't go out. Yeah. But that was the right thing to do. Or <clears throat> sometimes this is me now trying to use tennis jargon. A lad will do a little bit of a chip and charge, and, and he gets lobbed. And again, I like that. Next year when you're an inch taller, you'll make that. 
uh, and so the there is the there is the praising of the intent there is the that's the right decision that's correct or yeah. and so that that's really good and then very often at the end of the week that kind of review was uh there's very little praise so much on the technical but it's all about the attitude yeah and so he likes to praise Elijah in front of us so that we can then go home and go, did you hear what he said about good luck? And so Elijah leaves like, he might have lost the match, but Jordan noticed that I was trying these things. Yeah. And, these, and, you know, what is it that you're praising? Yeah, yeah, and, and doing the, the right yeah. things. And I think I only got that quite late. Yeah. Um, so, so Judy Murray coached me probably from about... Um, 14 through 17 yeah. intermittently because she was obviously traveling with the boys a bit at the time and it wasn't because i was like you know up here when the the best um it was more like i lived in dunblane she lived in dunblane and actually very close i sort of used to meet her in the end of the drive yeah. and, and go down to the courts but um she could always see that bigger picture and mm -hmm. what she was trying to do with my game for the future yeah. and i think up until that point uh, like i mentioned i hadn't really had that i'd kind of just gone on having been coached and expected yeah. to kind of know how to play. Um, and it was only then I think I got that understanding of my game and being mm -hmm. a tricky lefty and making life difficult yeah. for people. Um, and and that's quite interesting. And, and going back there, I suppose a lot now, it's trying to help players go into matches with kind of a couple of mm -hmm. goals that are around doing the, yeah. what would be, be kind of doing the right things here to help you develop. And so even just coming out with a couple of goals mm. for, for the match. And I think that's really important then that more kind of process stuff um, and, and then kind of being able to come at the end of the match and, and reflect on those. Yeah. And it might be that there's kind of, I always ask players to, okay, describe me the story of the match because matches, yeah, yeah go through, can, can be a bit topsy-turvy and, and, and sometimes there are kind of key events and not to make excuses about those events, but sometimes they do change the course. Mm. And I think the more that we can understand how they change the course so that then we can affect it, it next time uh, is important. Um, uh, uh, some of this comes from, I work quite closely with a coach called Alistair Hyam, whose um, interest is momentum. He's okay. written books on momentum in tennis. Um, not the labor movement, momentum. No. no very <laughs> So, so yeah, so matches kind of ebb and, and flow and yeah, getting players to reflect on those things that they set themselves for the match mm. or well, I committed to that in the first set, but um, I kind of backed off it or um, yeah, actually went for too much. But because then the learning from the match can quite accurately inform what they do with the coach in the, the next lesson mm. when the coach goes, oh, how did the weekend go? Yep. Um, and a, a kind of anecdote from a, a guy called, called Keith Reynolds who... Um, yeah, as a, a very renowned coach in, in this country and he used to often talk about why he would go and observe so many matches and that for him was about you know if I don't go and observe then I'll get back a different story from what actually yeah. happened yeah. Um, a bit like you said their interpretation yeah. versus yours and so I say oh well um, I'll, I'll get the story my second serve broke down but if you'd actually seen it you might have seen that their second serve broke down but only at the really critical points in the match where it was like 30-14 uh, at 4-5 because then when you go back to the drawing board and back to the training you actually you've got a diff you it's a different problem instead of working on something technical to do with the second serve it might be about kind of mimicking some of that adrenaline that mm. they might be feeling at those stages and trying to to work with with that um so so yeah i think that's really interesting it comes back to that okay well if i'm not trying to put my game onto court that i'm working on by doing the right things then I, i'm not informing training to the same extent so i'll often talk about them as kind of make an analogy with like race horses but um yeah if, if you're kind of going forward in the training then if if you're not putting it into place in the match then you're kind of holding yeah. yourself back if you're working in the training and putting it into place in the match that really informs the training and helps you move forward further in in that domain yeah. um because again i think you know a lot of players um uh, some some kind of things that um players might come to be about or, yeah it feels so different the training to to yeah. play matches so it's almost trying to how can we kind of get those two things closer mm. together what, what's the bit that's going on in emotionally for a lot of players it says when i practice the ball just i could do anything that goes in the minute i'm in a match it changes yeah i think our um, our emotions are or how how we feel like you, you yeah. said has a lot to do with it i think also 
because of some of the the sort of rating system and things we have these numbers kind of attached to us and therefore we can go in or or we know the player and, and we go in with these perceptions of i am the favored player or i am not the favored player and quite often you will see that um affecting how they go about a match because they're either trying to protect their ego by um not not losing to that player and so they play kind of that that not to lose variety of tennis or they kind of feel like oh i've got an opportunity to 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 really kind of test this opposition mm-hmm. today and and we'll um yeah really go after their game in another match and that match might be on the same day yep. um but so sometimes i think we can kind of make judgments um around our, our opposition and and again that's where uh, yeah, we're getting away from the matches being development opportunities and just that each opposition is just a different challenge. I think sometimes, again, in tennis, a lot of um, people get sucked in that, to that trap of chasing rankings. And some of that, again, is because you, you need certain ratings or rankings to get into yep. not only tournaments now, but some training. And I, I understand that, again, because you have to have some sort of parameters around that for, for selection and things like that. But I think it's been misunderstood as okay well we have to to chase those those points and i think the parents are aware of of it but i think it does kind of project sometimes onto the the kids and so they can quite often end up playing playing up if you like Mm -hmm. um more often and thinking that that is better for their development and you see that in training as well than, than wanting to just play with better players um, because I because I play worse when I play against worse opposition. Yeah. Basically, when the the there's less consistency, the ball drops shorter and and it yeah. goes higher, and I have more time, and I don't like generating my own pace or, or whatever that is. Um, but understanding that different players, um, yeah, have different skill sets, and you've got to be able to cope with it all. And some players you would see is quite an attacking style, or, and and others maybe mm. um, put more balls in the court. But and I sometimes think in this country we don't have like enough respect for those that are more the yep. the kind of counter punchers. Yep. We all say, oh, but they're just a hack. Just in like a year or so, you'll you'll be beating them. And and there is an argument, I suppose, for for those that are developing their game that they're going to get more consistent with their their attack. But as well, some of the stuff that the counter punchers do, I think, is very mm. smart as well. So so kind of. Just coming into land a little bit here is, are there any practical guides, practical tools that you could help us as parents uh, know how to best support uh, our kids emotionally? Uh, I'm just becoming very, very, very aware how, you know, tennis is a sport we're in, so the tennis racket is almost held by the heart half of the time when they're playing. It's such, so emotionally, it draws so much out. Are, Are there bits... Uh, tips that you could give us as parents as to how we might be able to to help our kids uh, journey through those emotions can't always take them away but help them process them better Uh, and anything that you would kind of flag up of history tells me if you do this and this that's just pouring paraffin on yeah I think at a global level I think there's definitely um, you know that with patience and understanding Mm. that they're going to get things wrong sometimes and that they are going to go on those emotional roller coasters and I think that sometimes can be quite well as I as I understand I'm I'm not a parent but um I I think speaking to a lot of parents I think that can be quite a a roller coaster for you so I can be quite uh, maybe upset uh, upsetting or or frustrating to see them struggle Mm -hmm. um and, and you know concerning I suppose to see you know is that kind of damaging their development when I'm seeing them go through all these you know should we just not not expose them to this yeah. anymore but um that was one of the the really big things I picked up from that research project was just that even if they felt like the experiences had been negative at the time now they saw them as a, as a real positive yeah. so that was something that was really interesting I think some of the psychological skills training stuff i think psychological skills are are really important for anyone to be you know effective at performing it at their best um under pressure so any sort of little sort of tools that you can help them to to build as as sort of strategies um when they are under pressure you know and anything that you would do to to kind of help calm them down if that's um not in a sporting context as well um you know if it might just be a little breathing exercise of counting into five and and out so so all those kind of small things that are tools and things that they can come back to i i sort of love breathing as a strategy i think it's a 
sort of tribal whammy strategy one more oxygen to the body relaxes you too we're a racket sport so typically when you get nervous your shoulders lift yep. so obviously your range of motion is a bit different so can kind of be quite helpful in that sense but also it's always something that you can come back to we know mm. there's a lot of uncontrollable things on a tennis court and I think yeah always having that that to come back to is quite reassuring um and and yeah can kind of help players when they're in it's quite public and quite an op- a quite a big open space especially when they're they're young yeah. um so so to have that to to kind of as a as a go to or, or or a range of other things um uh, the USTA are really big on all the kids having some sort of routine yeah. which again that's around control it's yeah. yeah normally something that helps them to um re- review and, and accept the last point something that helps them to sort of relax switch off a second something that helps them to prepare for the mm. next point um yeah there's lots of different yeah we've um, stuff had, around that, we, but. we the sports psychologist chap who's started to work with the larger a little bit kind of helped him coin a phrase of me here now primarily because um if you've ever seen the cartoon up a larger is one of the dogs that just goes squirrel and gets quite easily distracted and therefore the it, it's interesting how that little phrase has locked in his head and, and he now talks about regularly that in between points you can see him saying me it's me here now i'm i'm focused yeah. and so um every time we put a new overgrip on his racket we write me here now on the overgrip yeah a, a couple of times so no matter if he's spinning the racket round, he can always see it and it's just that little reminder of I, I, as dad, can't teach you or tell you really how to do a proper smash or any of those kind of technical aspects, but I can keep on encouraging it right now. Forget the last point. It's you. It's a new point. Focus. Yeah. Uh, and that's been incredibly beneficial and probably one of the best things I, as dad, have done for him in a long while is literally just writing me here now on his overgrip. And for yeah. him, that works. Yeah. And it, it is those little things. And I think there's no one thing that works nope, for everyone. I think that's a really nice thing around being present. Another thing that, yep. that kind of breathing helps to, to do because in tennis, you've got so much time to think. So you, either your mind can be in the future about what's going to be the outcome of this, what's going to happen, da, da, da. Um, or it can be thinking of the past about missed opportunities, that yep. break point chance that you had, or that line call that, that it could have been three all and it's now two, four, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, really like that around getting in the the present. Um, yeah, rather than ruminating uh, both sides of the the coin. Um, yeah, so different things for for different people, I suppose. And it, it can it can be really silly and small things. I think it's more about the meaning that the player kind of attaches yep. to that. I used to work with a, a squash player, and you know they almost like wipe their sweat on the the back of the um, <laughs> yeah. glass. Like that for her was like just leaving la- leaving the last That's point behind because it was kind of a behavioral thing. Or whether sometimes if you're on clay is better than hard courts for this, yeah. but like just stubbing your foot into the ground, not in a, an aggressive way so so much, but just yeah, just kind of scrub it out, leave it behind type thing. Yeah. And I think um, some players yeah definitely find that helpful. I mean. Again, using the towel sounds like such a silly one, but if you come back to that awareness, understand that one of your tendencies under pressure is to rush, then using the towel is really beneficial. And um, it's funny because, so one of the players I I worked with played Junior Wimbledon um, and they'd gone from most of the time playing and obviously picking up their own tennis balls to having ball boys and ball girls. And even that, it's... It's going from, yeah, doing what you'd normally do to something's changed, but it sped you up so much. It's made you feel like you have to play quicker and you don't. So that maybe um, made using the towel even more important. Um, so that's quite quite interesting as well. How can you take time? Yeah. and um, But also how might you try and speed things up when mm-hmm. things are going your way? Because that could be quite interesting with the, the introduction of the, is it the, the, the clock to time down so you're not taking too long Uh, and so even though you've got that same amount of time some might see the clock ticking down and it might almost speed them up too much because they'll feel under pressure to get on with the serve yeah yeah absolutely i think obviously the level that that's being used at i think that just kind of yeah yeah that they all kind of know their tendency and they would yeah be aware not to to rush um but yeah it's it is an interesting one coming into the game at the moment um, this has been a fantastic chat. We could go on forever, but I'm very conscious that we, we can't. Um, so 
if if anyone who is listening would like to connect with you, kind of engage with any of the, the support that you can offer or anything like that, how, how can people get in get in contact with you? Uh, so I have a website, uh, JB Sport Psych. Sport is in yeah, sport without the S. Some people go sports and and don't find me, um, but but yeah, I'm sure if you you Google it, you'll find the website uh, which has my my contact details on it. Um, also on Twitter at JB underscore Sport Psych cool. or Instagram on the same handle. Great. I will make sure all the links are on on the bottom of this uh, podcast on the on the website. Thank you so much for joining us. I really did appreciate it. That was a fantastic and fascinating conversation. Very welcome. And, uh, I enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much for joining right. us. Thank you. So welcome back to the courtside post-match reflection. Unfortunately, uh, this time round, Kath can't be with us due to the uh, busyness of life. Sometimes these things aren't always possible. So I'll make sure this is a, a short one because most, as she keeps telling me, wisdom will always come from her. Just some reflections for for me as a parent courtside after having that brilliant conversation there with, with, with Julie. It was something, there was a couple of things that she mentioned that uh, just echoed that I'm going to take on uh, as parent was just this whole conversation around helping our kids know themselves better so then they can really own their game. And and I wondered whether where that comes for us as parents uh, when we fall into the trap of comparison, that whether, uh, like me sometimes, you'll see your child playing whatever discipline, whatever sport, whatever level they're at, and you wonder why they don't play like the other child or why, whether they should be behaving in a manner like the other child does. Uh, and how much does that rob our kids of expressing themselves through how they've been created and through, uh, which is a much more integral way of how they would want to play. Uh, and so that whole comparison bit of us wanting our kids to be like some like someone else's kids who's thriving and achieving more, how much does that rob our kids of the ability of simply expressing themselves uh, and allowing their brilliance to shine? Uh, another bit that came out of it was, and I'd, I hadn't really clocked this before, is trying to get that whole variety of match plays that they're not playing the same uh, opponents uh, week in, week out. And that, that phrase of ego protection is going to sit with me for a while. The the advantage of enabling our children to play a wide breadth of either teams or different players so that the matches exposes them to different challenges, but also removes the, I'm, I'm playing you on a regular basis, and therefore just the desire to be top of the internal in-house league, uh, which probably holds them back from developing their game. Uh, and if we're honest as parents, we probably spend half of our time wanting our kid to be the top kid in the club. Uh, and how much does that hold them back from actually becoming the player they could become uh, because they can't always sustain or maintain being number one within the club? So there were just a couple of um, thoughts and reflections from me. I'm really grateful to, to Julie for spending the, the time with us uh, a couple of weeks back to record that. Please do pass on this podcast to friends and others who are other fellow courtsiders so we can increase the following uh, and increase the learning together. Wherever your sport takes you over the next uh, week or two, I hope you thoroughly enjoy yourselves. All the very best. <laughs>